we're focused on the wrong thing. The unemployment rate is a, is a metric that's really an artifact held over from the depression mm -hmm. back during a time when, when we looked at the number of people out of work, our assumption was we could correct that by simply creating more opportunities. But those days are gone. And today, as you and I sit here chatting, we, we, we have 11 million open positions in the country. More and more people are taking a lot of time off, not just holidays, but seemingly for good. The jobs are certainly available, over 10 million, according to the latest government count, but not always the jobs that people seem to want to have. So what is behind this alteration in the workplace? What are people looking for? And do they truly understand what jobs provide a solid income, fulfilling work, and a promising future? Well, there's no one better equipped to answer that question than Mike Rowe. Mike, thank you so much for your time. This is, a, this is a, an unexpected pleasure for me. Thanks for having me, Doug. I do appreciate it. You know, I, I, I think among the many things I could say about you, the, the first that comes to mind is, is something that... Uh, has been very important in my career. Uh, and people tell me all the time, you've got a good voice, but it ain't nothing compared to your voice. And that's helped you a lot through the years, hasn't it? You know, it hasn't hurt. I guess maybe um, when I look back at my misspent career, it really began with Forrest Gumping my way into the Baltimore Opera way back in 1982. And then, you know how it goes, way leads on the way, and the next thing you know, you're sitting in your basement getting interviewed by a guy like you. <laughs> well, that's an interesting story about your force gumping it into the Baltimore Opera because uh, actually you needed a union card, right? A musician's union card. And so he thought the best way to get one was to volunteer to sing opera. That's an unusual well, I, route. I, I, I really, I wasn't looking for, I wasn't looking to be in the opera. I was looking to get my Screen Actors Guild ah. card, which would allow me to get an agent, which would allow me to audition for the kinds of projects I thought I wanted to do. Uh -huh. But I couldn't get my Screen Actors Guild card unless I did Screen Actors Guild work. And so there was this weird circle. But I found a loophole. If you can get your union card in the singing organization, the American Guild of <laughs> Musical Artists, then you can basically buy your way into the other stuff. So, uh -huh. so you, you can't had, script it, but that's the way it happened. But you had to audition, right? I had to audition. I learned the, uh, I learned the shortest Italian aria I could find. I went to the local library, and it was uh, Puccini. It was the uh -huh. coat aria from La Boheme. I memorized it, walking around Baltimore, listening you to my Sony Walkman, crashed the audition, <laughs> somehow got in. You, you want to resurrect that audition for us? Are you brave enough to do that? Something like that. I know. It was loud and low. Well, it, it's, it's not bad. I was I was expecting. <laughs> That's what I was shooting for, Doug. <laughs> well, uh, didn't didn't the guy who was listening to your audition say that uh, you don't know what you're doing? It sounds a lot to me like you know. He what did. Doing. Yeah, yeah. He, he, his name was Billy Nutzi. He was a brilliant <laughs> musical director at the time. I had no idea who he was, but he spoke five languages, could play any instrument, and wow. he uh, he he let me get through the whole thing. And when I finished, he said, uh, "Mr. O." Um, you don't have the faintest idea what you're talking about, do you? <laughs> I said, I, I really don't. I just memorized a bunch of sounds. But they, they needed young men with low voices. I see. And I see. so I checked the box, and they gave me a shot. And the next thing you knew, I was singing it eight years later, still there. Well, were you born with that? Uh, well, well not, not born with it, but when, after puberty, did you have that voice, that rich baritone, or did you have to work at that? My, um... My voice actually changed when I was very young. It, mm -hmm. But when I was 11 or 12, you know, I, I went through that weird, terribly awkward thing. But for me, what it made, what made it especially weird and awkward was I had a, uh, I had a stammer, not a full on porky pig kind of stutter, but I, I had a real stammer and it was brought on by nervousness. So I was just weird geeky kid with a low voice who kind of stuttered his way through elementary school and uh junior high but 
you know, it just goes to show you can grow on anything. Well, yeah, that, that's funny because I, I once uh, took a college course on broadcasting. It was just a summer course, and I didn't take it very seriously. Uh, and the professor told me after I did a little audition doing the weather, you know, I was gesturing to the weather map, and he pulled me aside after class and said, look, don't go into broadcasting. Just just give it up right now. <laughs> and then 42 years later, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still doing it. So, yeah, so much for the experts. Um, but, you know, this, this is really fascinating how you've made your living because it, most people know that voice and that face from, from the narrations you do and the, the TV shows that you've hosted. But you have very strong editorial content. You've gotten to a position where you, you can ex exercise that, correct? Yes. You know, it's funny what happens when you keep showing up, right? And the, and the shows keep going on. And then, if you're lucky, the, the headlines will sometimes catch up to the show mm -hmm. and make it relevant in ways that the network never imagined or that I certainly didn't predict. That's what happened with Dirty Jobs and Deadliest Catch and Somebody's Got to Do It and Returning the Favor. Truth is, Doug, I, I've been doing the same show for 20 years. I just changed the title uh -huh. every five or six years to, you know, <laughs> s snaz it up a little bit. But my, my job, to the extent that I have one on camera, is to tap the country on the shoulder and, um, and remind them from time to time that there's a whole category of work that's going on that a lot of people don't focus on. And, uh, and to ask the question, hey, what about him? What about her? Get a load of this. Mm -hmm. You know, th there's a lot going on out there in the wide world of work that, that doesn't get a lot of attention. And once I, once I sort of figured out that formula and kept doing it, I got more and more permission to peel back the layers and start to conclude some things right. from uh, from my experiences in the dirt. Well, this is this is where your real genius comes into play, Mike, and and why it's such a pleasure <laughs> to speak to you. Is that you you have been focusing, uh, in large part, in, in, in these many many endeavors on uh, ch channels that are outside stuff that you don't see on network television, certainly on network news or cable news which is you know, geographically and eccentrically located in Washington, D.C., New York, and L.A., and the rest of the whole world is sort of flyover country. You have focused on that, and the, the great stories in America, I have often maintained, are, are in those areas that you go to. I'm, I'm born and raised in, in Washington, D.C., uh, a white-collar town, and there's so many people crawling through that city who think they're the smartest people on, in, the, in, <laughs> in the world, and they're just deceiving themselves to be kind about it. And, and that brings me to a Washington subject matter, which is the labor mm. force participation rate, which is a really important statistic. I just checked what it was for the month of October 19, uh, uh, 2022, and it is at 62.3%, which is really troubling. You said, and let me quote, Seven million able-bodied men between the ages of 25 and 54 are not only not working, they are affirmatively not looking for work. They've punched out. They're done. The vast majority of them spend over 2,000 hours a year on screens. What does this mean to society? Well, I did say that. Um, I was quoting a, an economist named uh, Nick Eberstadt, who I had on my podcast not long ago. And uh, Nick has been writing about this for years, really since 2005. He had a terrific book called uh, Men Without Work. And he's, he's put it out again because in the wake of the pandemic and the lockdown, something truly extraordinary has happened. We have four million more unfilled positions than we did in 2020. And we have four million fewer workers in the workforce. At the same time, it's almost mirror images, right? So what Nick said and what and what got my attention was that we um, were focused on the wrong thing. The unemployment rate is a is a metric that's really an artifact held over from the depression mm -hmm. back during a time when when we looked at the number of people out of work, our assumption was we could correct that by simply creating more opportunities. But those days are gone. And today, as you and I sit here chatting, we, we, we have 11 million open positions in the country. And 
<laughs> many of those p open positions, they, they don't require four-year degrees. They, they require training. They, they require competency. And they require people who are willing to show up early and, and stay late and learn a skill that's in demand. So that's just the reality of the market that we're in. The fact that 7 million men, able-bodied men between 25 and 54 have punched out, that is troubling because our country has never seen that statistic before in peacetime. And so what does it mean? I don't, I don't know exactly, but I do know that the existence of so much opportunity uh, at one time says something new about where we're headed as a country. Mm -hmm. More from Mike Rowe on this special edition of Centerpoint in just 90 seconds. And now rejoining our interview with Mike Rowe. I, I don't want to make this uh, too terribly political because I, I do think that both major political parties in this country have contributed to it. But the fact is that many, many more people today depend on government assistance than they did in, in the past. Um, again, a quote from a recent Fox News poll uh, echoes your sentiments. The survey showed that a majority of Americans would prefer the government lend them a hand as they battle various economic woes like rising consumer prices, as opposed to those who want to do it on their own. That's another troubling statistic. It is. And look, it, I mean, it's impossible not to politicize every single thing today. I, I understand that. I run a, a nonpartisan foundation called Microworks. I work really hard to try and stay in the middle, but it's increasingly difficult. And even with this topic, Doug, when you, when you talk about 7 million people who are affirmatively not looking for work who otherwise could work, well, it breaks down like this. My friends on the left will tell me that this problem could be corrected if the employers simply paid more money. Mm -hmm. And my friends on the right say, well, this problem is fundamental because those people are fundamentally lazy. And I've got my own opinion, but I suspect the real truth of the thing is somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. what, what you were saying earlier about you know, white collar and, and blue collar, it, it, it touches on this too. I don't, I don't think we're living in a time anymore where the color of collars can be as determinative as it used to be. I think it's just work. The number of people who want help right now, they're not looking at resumes. They're not looking where'd you go to school. They, they'll train you if you need training. It's not, in other words, a skills gap. The way I used to think it was, the way I often used to talk about the problem, it's a will gap. You're talking about people who are opting out because they simply don't possess the will to work. Mm -hmm. To your point, some of those people are able to make that decision because they're being subsidized in a variety of ways, maybe by the government, maybe by some welfare program. You know, the whole disability thing, unfortunately, is a is a big topic, too. There are plenty of people who are legitimately disabled who are out of the workforce. But the overwhelming number of people collecting disability are doing so for one of two reasons. And Nick Eberstadt told me this as well, and he showed me the data. Back pain or mental anguish. Coincidentally, the two areas that are simply impossible to prove. <laughs> and so it's right. very, very hard to know exactly how, how much shenanigans is, is going on in all of this. Right. But it's safe to say a fair amount. You know, I wonder. I wonder in major metropolitan areas if the modern day workforce, uh, workplace, I should say, has contributed to this, this uh, desire not to work. In the sense that, um, you know, everybody shows up in the office. It, it's changing a little bit since COVID because people can work out of their homes. But it, it was and may return, maybe not, uh, to a place where you go into the office, you get in your little cubicle, you stare at the screen. Um, maybe you'll interact with people and maybe somebody won't like what you say, in which case you go down the hall to visit the HR department and they, they slap you on the wrist for something you said. And then you go back to your little cubicle and stare at the screen and you do it for, you know, 40 hours a week and, and life is really not rewarding. And this is where, you know, the, the service industry and, and some of the, 
uh, and I hate to use the term blue collar jobs that you've cited so often, but, but things for people who are working with their hands and learning trades and skills really come uh, into play. And, and they're, they're really high paying jobs and in many respects, I would argue much more rewarding than the modern day workplace. I wouldn't disagree with you. You know, my, my desk here in my office looks pretty much the same at 6 p.m. as it does at 6 a.m. I don't have a lot of visual cues when I'm home to let me know when I'm done. But when you're shooting dirty jobs, when you're working on a crab boat, when you're, when you're working in a mine, you, you know how you're doing all of the time. Doesn't mean there's not an HR department at the end of some long plastic hallway far away from where you're laboring. But to your point, it's far away from where you're laboring. You don't have that element in your face all of the time. So, you know, again, I, 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 I hesitate to say this, not that, or even this or that. It's, it's this and that. Our workforce um, is really two sides of the same coin. And we've put ourselves in a terrible box right now by categorizing what that guy's doing and what that mm -hmm. guy's doing right now, not as opportunities, but as vocational consolation prizes, something that people have to do when they're unable to get into the right school or when they somehow manage to, to, to not stay on the preferred path. Mm -hmm. We've put our thumb on the scale and we have, as a result, consigned a whole category of really important jobs into something subordinate to all of the other jobs. And, and, and that's created an imbalance in the workforce. It's created, I think, a frustration in the minds of a lot of workers. To your point, you throw on top of that the confusion of what a good job looks like and what exactly a worker is supposed to do in this day and age. And it's difficult to know. I just read an article where hundreds of people at Apple wrote a letter to Tim Cook, the big, big boss, essentially a list of demands. No, we will not come into work three days a week. No, thank you. We don't want to do that. Here are the things we want to do and so forth and so on. And, you know, when I was growing up and I, I'm going to go ahead and guess that, you know, you and I were going through school at similar times. That, that didn't happen. Right. You don't no, have those kinds of happen. conversations with your boss. It just doesn't happen. Right. So we're in a different world. We're in a different time. And people aren't quite sure what the rules are. But I'm here to tell you that there is still a path to prosperity that starts with mastering a skill that's in demand and going to work. Ha has your endeavor in this regard uh, resulted in, in uh, measurable benefits? I mean, have you been able to quantify what you're doing? It's a great question. It's a great question, and it's a it's a hard question to answer um, without sounding glib. Mm -hmm. But it's a micro issue and a macro issue. No pun intended. My foundation has assisted uh, 1,700 people. We give away a couple million bucks a year in work ethic scholarships, specifically to people who don't want to go to a four year school but who want to pursue. Uh, these trades. So I can tell you on a, on a micro level, I can tell you 1,700 stories about 1,700 lives that have been transformed for the better. And I feel great about that. Um, are we changing on a national level the discourse around this issue? I think I think we are starting to move the needle. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been at this now 15 years. I've been to Congress, I don't know how many times. I've talked to a lot of CEOs and a lot of big companies about what has to happen to, to reset the table. Um, but it's, it's really difficult on a big level to know what kind of impact you're having. The politics are constantly changing. The metrics are constantly evolving. People will always point to different sets of numbers that indicate different trends, right? Uh, and so I, I get the sense that we are, but what I'll tell you is it's like PR, like a big national PR campaign to change the way the country feels about work. That, that hasn't happened since the weeping Indian on the side of the road 
tried to change the way the country felt about litter. Mm -hmm. And it worked. That was the Keep America Beautiful campaign. Right. And the the effect of that campaign did have a demonstrable effect on the way people thought about pollution and litter. But it took about 15 years. It took a long it takes a long time yeah. to get people to think differently about a career as a plumber. You've got to you've got to attack stigmas, stereotypes, myths, misperceptions. Mm -hmm. It's work. Well, there there are speaking of myths and stereotypes, many of those are now flourishing. Uh, in regard to college campuses and going to college, given the cost of tuition, given the, the mediocrity of a lot of the offerings, the lack of critical thinking, people come out of them just completely unprepared for levels of work. And, and because the mantra is that everybody should be able to go to college, the kind of jobs that you're talking about are, are inherently diminished. But people are finding out that the rewards for these huge expenses are just not there anymore. So maybe that option that you're talking about is becoming much more appealing. I think it is, but I'm also mindful to not try to not paint with too broad a brush. And this again, it's back to the essential problem. I don't know how many people are listening to this conversation that we're having and I and I don't know how many of them need to be encouraged or discouraged to do one thing or the other. It's why I'm I've, I've become kind of stingy with my advice. It's not because I don't have opinions, but it's because I still think the path to the university is important and really, really valuable for a lot of people. But I also think the other path is equally important and equally valuable. Mm -hmm. And so the trap is how do we promote one category of education and jobs without disparaging the other. And that is very, very, very difficult to do. But we have to try, because, I mean, I'll tell you, I've, I've been at it a while, and almost without fail, at the end of every interview, somebody will look at it and then quickly assume that I'm the anti-college guy. I'm right. the anti-education guy. Right, right. That's not true. Uh, I'm the anti-debt guy, and, I, and I'll tell you that, you know, my liberal arts degree served me very well. And I was finished in 1984, two years of community college, two years of university. Whole thing cost 12 grand. Today, same schools, same case, same, same course load, $92,000. So mm -hmm. that's part of this too, Doug. You know, we can't, we can't have the conversation about the value of college without pointing out that nothing has increased in cost faster not food, not energy, not health care, not real estate. Nothing has gotten more expensive faster than the cost of a four-year degree. That's a heck of a thing. Right, and unless the government pays it off, but, but that doesn't even account for the, the massive amount of, of personal debts from other areas that we're going to have to reckon with at some, some time. Um, uh, on the subject of work, you're a busy man. You've got all these endeavors going on, including the one on TV, and you start a new season. Uh, I think you yeah. just started it right now, as a matter of fact. Yeah, we're back. Uh, it's called The Story Behind the Story, which basically are uh, cinematic recreations of these short stories I wrote for my podcast called The Way I Heard It, uh, based on uh, the, the Paul Harvey Jr. style of telling a story. They're mysteries. You know, it's a fun way to learn something you didn't know about someone you do, and you get to figure out who we're talking about along the way. So, uh Matt Crouch brought these things to life, and then after each one, we sit down and, and talk about uh, maybe the morality play that might be going on underneath the surface, or what I got right, what I got wrong, why I wrote the story in the first place. It's, it, it's been a really fun series to work on. We just, we just finished shooting the third season, and the second season is just now getting on the air. So. Fantastic. Well, That's I've had, great. I, I've watched several of them, and I was watching a few more just before this interview. Uh, they, they are extraordinarily well-produced, extraordinarily well-written, and, of course, none of that matters if you don't have the pipes. You got the pipes, man. <laughs> uh, so it's yeah, perfect. It's, pipe, it's, like, it's like an opera to my ears. <laughs> Life is go. like an opera. Did I just, bring, like I just brought it home, didn't I, with that last remark? You, <laughs> you landed the plane, Doug. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. Very nice. It wasn't all that smooth, but thanks anyway, Mike. What a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, sir. Likewise. Thanks for having me on.
when we come back, one man's very fulfilling journey to the workplace. And finally tonight, some real life wisdom about work, the examples that we set for our children and the heartfelt joy that comes with doing things the right way. The following was written by a regular viewer of Centerpoint. Listen to his story now. Quote, I had a student loan once from my pops for law school. He paid my tuition, books, and half my rent and had me sign a promissory note at 12% interest. All I had to do was make good grades, work part-time to pay my one half of the rent, food and gas, and pass the bar, of course. The payment plan was $12,000 a year or 10% of my gross income, whichever was greater when I got my first job, paid every month on the last day of the month. And we added to it each semester over three years. It went up and up with interest accruing as it went up into six figures. Eventually, my secret expectation was that he would forgive the debt as a gift when I graduated. Nope. When I got my bar card, I felt like I was dealing with a mafia loan shark. I paid him back every penny with full interest, quicker than I thought I would. I still have that old promissory note in a file somewhere with his handwritten paid in full on it. And I never allowed him to buy another meal at a restaurant for the rest of his or mom's life. When I was with them, they fed me for the first 30 years. I figured I can do it for the next 30 years plus. Just before he passed, we were talking about the old days, and I thanked him for putting me through law school and holding me to my word to pay him back. It taught me discipline in financial matters and a lesson in being a man of my word. His response was, quote, you were the best investment I ever made. And then he went on to tell me that he and mom cashed in their life savings, then mortgaged their home to keep me in school. He never told me that part of the story before. He simply believed in me. Love and honor him and mom. And that's going to do it for Centerpoint tonight. I'm Doug McElway. We hope you have a great night.